everyone. Welcome back to A Plus Parents. And are you ready with me today? So if you ever had that idea where it's like, what would it be like to just do things differently? Like you were traveling, you're doing your thing. Maybe you're thinking about the RV experience where you're traveling around the U.S. or wherever you might live. But what if you were on a boat? So today, my guest, Tanya Hackney, uh, is with us. She's been living on a boat for the last 15 years. Uh, she has five children, and uh, two of them now are grown and off and doing their own thing. But we're going to get to hear all about them and their adventures and all the places they've done this. And she's homeschooled all of them from the boat over the last 15 years. So a little bit about Tanya. She graduated with her BA from Middlebury College in 1997, which is in Vermont. Uh, but she, so think of this, a major in English, a double major in French and in education. So she was getting herself ready to be a homeschool mom, which is absolutely perfect, right? She married her high school sweetheart, which is so sweet. And then she taught kindergarten in Atlanta before they took on the idea of homeschooling all five kids aboard a sea vessel. And their sea vessel, their sailing vessel is called Take Two. So uh, lived abroad now for 15 years. And in fact, when they started, or think of this, okay? Not only are they on the boat and traveling by boat everywhere on a sailboat, but her children were seven, six, four, one and a half, and number five came along while they were in their travels, which is super cool. So, um, so Tanya has a blog, and we're going to be able to give you all the show show links so you can see more about how does she do it, how does she how does she make and make all this work with her family, and uh, also all kinds of social media, so you can get on there and you can see all that as well. So she's actually had a chance to study in Paris. Uh, they honeymoon in Mexico. So you just kind of just keep thinking that she's got a book published called, uh, it's, a, it's a memoir called Leaving the Safe Harbor. Make sure I read this right. Leaving the Safe Harbor, the risk and rewards of raising a family on a boat. So uh, they have hurricane plans. They kind of manage all that for when they're traveling and where they are. And so in free time. And if you think of five kids on a boat traveling all around, <laughs> and there's still free time, right? But there's playing the ukulele, painting, landscaping, and even in kayaks. So First of all, Tanya, welcome to A Plus Parents to the podcast. Just super excited to have you here. And anything I left out, anything else you want to share with anyone? No, thank you so much for having me and for letting me tell a little piece of my story. And would you like me to call you Dennis or, or Dr. D? Yeah, either is good. Actually, just Mr. D, but Dennis. Mr. Is D. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So all I'm, right, great. I, I went to the website to get the Dr. D domain. They didn't have it. So I thought, oh, well, okay. I'm not going to get my PhD because if I can't have the domain, there's no reason to get the PhD, right? So, <laughs> right, right. The domain <laughs> comes first, clearly. That's right. The domain comes first. So there we go. Okay. So, you know, and, you know, my background, I was a public school teacher way mm -hmm. back when I actually started back in 1988, if you can imagine that, it's been a long time ago. Uh, and then I made the transition into homeschooling back in 2008. So, um, about the time you guys got on the got on the water, right? So that's right. That's the year yeah. we bought our boat. That's super cool. But you also have that same background. I I call us recovering teachers, right? You know, like we're oh, a yeah. school teacher, right? So you started out there. You were teaching kindergarten, and you know when you when you started to notice, was there something that happened that said to you, you know, I think we're going on the homeschool route or kind of how did that happen that you decided to, to do homeschooling? And did that coincide with the boat or how the kind of the story about how all that came about? Sure. Well, my husband had grown up sailing. And so that was kind of a dream that he had always had. Um, he did summers uh, on his dad's catamaran, um, gun coaling in the Florida Keys and things like that. And the summer in love, when we were in high school, he was actually sanding the bottom of his dad's boat. So boats were kind of always a part of our life. Uh, right after we were newlyweds, we had gone on a sailing trip with his dad and stepmom um, out to Dry Tortugas National Park, which is uh, a day's sail west of Key West. It's out in the middle of nowhere. It's amazing. Um, mm -hmm. So I really got to find out if I like what life is like on the water, uh, what it's like to be out of sight of land. So that's a, a great trip to take to find out if you're going to freak out or not, <laughs> which I did not. So, um, so we had this kind of dream that we always talked about sailing away with our kids. We thought that would be so fun. You know, could we do something different? Um, but the nitty gritty and the practical of how to do that, we had no idea. So we we did what everybody else does. We graduated from high school. We went to college. We got jobs. We got married. We had a couple of kids. We had a house, you know, like a little three-two with a white picket fence uh, outside of Atlanta. 
I taught elementary school and I loved my job. It's what I had always wanted to do. I love teaching kindergarten. Um, it was a really hard job. It was the hardest job that I had ever had right up there with homeschooling. I mean, <laughs> at least with public school, you can come home at the end of the day. You know, right. as it is with homeschooling, no one pays you. Um, the students complain from time to time and uh, you can never come home from your job. So, but right. I also think that the harder the job, the more rewarding it is. Absolutely. Yeah. You, the greatest thing we ever did for our kids was choosing to homeschool. So there's just yeah. no, no doubt about it. So, so there's you, a little bit, you asked me why I, why I made the yeah. transition. Um, yeah. I think there's a little bit of... Um, like if you ever worked at a restaurant where you saw rats and cockroaches, then you would not eat at that restaurant. So I sort of felt like from the inside, there were enough things that I saw that I would feel really uncomfortable sending my kids to public school. So it wasn't, and it wasn't just like the bad things that I didn't want them to get. It was also things like a lack of field trips. I mean, we had to plan really hard to get a field trip in the fall and a field trip in the spring. And this was in kindergarten where so much of what kids at that age are learning, um, the things are hands-on and should be on location and should be experiential and not just, you know, pushing pencils. I thought all year, these poor kids, they only got to go on two field trips. Like, this is crazy. If I homeschool, uh, everything that we learn could be hands-on and on location. So it wasn't just the negative things that I was trying to avoid. It was also the positive things that I was trying to add in. And of course, you can learn um, everything when they're little. You can learn everything through games and experiences. And you can add so much art and music and fun to the to the education that I thought, at least for the first few years, you know, I knew that I would be comfortable homeschooling my own kids. Wow. And, and that didn't stop because off they went and you've got now, I think you, you told me you're, uh, so you're, you're, uh, you've got three that have graduated high school and all of them were dual enrolled while they lived on a boat during that time. And they all ended up being able to finish, finish high school with college credits. I think, was it your daughter that she has her AA degree already? And she's, yes. and that's yeah. cool, right? Yeah, so you just fast forwarded through their entire uh, education, but um, we were able to start homeschooling them while we lived in the house. And then when we started transitioning to boat life, which was a dream that we were, you know, actively pursuing while my oldest was in kindergarten or first grade, like there's no school system that would have put up with our crazy schedule or our travels or anything. So we got really quickly funneled into homeschooling permanently where I thought, oh, well, we'll just take it year by year. Um, it became clear really quickly that if we wanted to travel, that that was just going to be what we did. Wow. But then, that's really great. Yeah. But then by the time, so we, we really felt like traveling broadened their horizons and gave our kids opportunities to see things and do things that they wouldn't, you know, not normally get to do. Um, the year that we were studying American history, we were traveling up the Eastern seaboard of the United States, and we were able to do things like stop in St. Augustine and study the, the oldest city in America. And then we went up into the Chesapeake and we were um, anchored right near the Yorktown battlefield and the history triangle. And we, um, motored up the Potomac and we went to Mount Vernon by water, which is really cool. That's how people would have gone to see, you know, George and Martha Washington, it was by water. And then we were able to do all these amazing field trips, um, walking from the waterfront in Washington, DC, you know, to the Smithsonian. And so all of our field trips have dovetailed really nicely into our kids' education. But there came a point at which all of our travels, while at while they were still expanding our horizons, were also somewhat limiting. So by the time our kids were in high school, we were traveling through the Caribbean. And we started to realize as our oldest approached 18, that launching him from Central America was going to be really challenging. And there were, you know, they were starting to make noises about wanting to go back to the United States. And so we came back to the Florida Keys, which was a place we had known well. And we gave them um, some stability. So for the last couple of years, although we're still living on the boat, we're doing less and less travel and just more staying because kids need cars and jobs and phones and friends and girlfriends and jujitsu and, you know, all those cool things that, that kids want to do that what it was a lot harder when we were traveling. Right, right. 
Joe, it, it, I'm thinking now, I'm just even thinking about being on a boat itself, especially a sailboat. And you're traveling, you've got, you know, five kids, all under, all under 10 years old, as you, as you begin this journey, right? And here you go, and you make this transition. <laughs> you, you have, I, I was, you know, I hear this word land lover, you know, and it's kind of yep. a, a funny thing, right? But you went from being that land lover kind of a family to sailors and you did it with five kids under 10 on a sailboat. How does that work? Uh, well, we're still sane for the most part. So we survived <laughs> it. Uh, the first couple of years were definitely the hardest. We advocate kind of a baby step approach. And so when we first bought the boat, we just did weekends aboard. Initially, we were just, you know, packing the kids in the car, you know, taking just weekend supplies, going down to the boat, the boat was at a dock. So it was a relatively safe, safe space to start to adjust just to the space, get the kids familiar with the rules. Um, I mean, you don't want your kids to drown. Like the first thing that you're thinking about when you move aboard with a toddler is how are we going to keep this kid alive you know and our our fourth was very adventurous and he swam really well by the time he was two and a half so we had a, a pool at the marina and we would um, we wanted to get him swimming as quickly as possible so we did some safety swimming but also just wanted him to really be comfortable in the water so the first year was just adjusting to the space fixing things that were broken getting that toddler swimming teaching everybody how to work as a team, how to, how to shrink. Really, we suffered a lot of shrinking pains. You know, when we left Atlanta, we sold probably half of our stuff, moved into a smaller house in Florida. And then we lived there for a few years while we were boat shopping. And then when we moved onto the boat, we got rid of another 90% of our stuff. And so you're moving this family of six and then later seven into less than a thousand square feet. I mean, really, it's more like 700 between 700 and 750 square feet of living space of course the yard is an immense it's the whole world right the backyard right. is you know is an endless blue horizon but the actual living space is really small and when someone says tight quarters i know exactly what that means i mean we have <laughs> literally live in close quarters wow that's that's actually amazing and you know how great because you really looked at it from a team approach right and it was gonna and everybody could participate everybody got things to do which is awesome and i i think it's great because you were you were sharing about you know travel up the travel up the eastern seaboard and you get to see places like st augustine and, and travel up the the potomac river how cool is that right yeah yeah you know and so you know i mean and i agree i think traveling for by far is the best education because if you want to see something you want to be there so you can really see it and you find out about, because you're seeing it with your own eyes you can touch it feel it so you know for you I, I'm, I'm going to take a guess you probably agree with that but but why why is it for you that that even travel being the, the best way to educate how did you how did you discover that for yourselves knowing that it probably seemed like that, but then when you really did it, what did you notice? Well, I, because I loved to travel as a kid, we took countless road trips with my family. My, my dad was a big, big advocate of road tripping. So I knew from growing up that way, how much my understanding of just our country was expanded from these cross country road trips. And I just wanted to keep rippling outwards. So I had studied abroad, you mentioned that earlier, and my husband and I had honeymooned in Mexico and we knew that travel was gonna be a part of our lives. Um, when you start talking about how to travel with a family of seven, I mean, it really came down to RV or boat because how else are you going to be able even like just the cost of airfare like it was just crazy to think about i mean there are people who manage to world school and and live in other countries but for us um being able to live a traveling lifestyle uh, made the most sense and then what we learned as we traveled was really that people everywhere are fundamentally the same. They want the same things. Like we learned that everybody eats everywhere you go. The food is different, but you can find fellowship with people that you may not even speak their language or be from their culture, but you can share friendship over a meal. Um, we learned that rich or poor, there's a lot of things that we have in common as human beings. And so we began to see ourselves as part of the big human family and not you know, just part of a certain region or country 
you know, we identify as as human beings first and maybe as Americans second. And so that was one of the really big things that happened as we traveled and the island hopped, especially through the Caribbean and Central America. Um, we really grew to appreciate things that we didn't appreciate before. I mean, simple things like a long hot shower. We make our own water from a desalinator and that costs electricity either from the sun or from our generator, which is fuel. And so you count every drop of water. We literally have um, a gallon meter on our on our pump, on our water pump that measures how much water is going out. And so when you go to take a shower, you know, the goal is a one gallon shower. And uh, when we first moved aboard, we didn't even have hot water. So it was one gallon cold shower. And, you know, now we're living in luxury because we have a, a much better water maker. And we, as a family, use about 75 gallons a day. It's about 10 gallons per person per day. And by boating standards, that's a lot of water. Most people shoot for half that. Mm. Um, and so because we make our own water, we can always make more. But you think about what how much water a household uses, a, a, how a, a average household might use a thousand gallons a day, you would stand in the shower for 20 minutes and not even think about it. Right, right. So when I go into a, you know, when we would arrive at a marina and we would go up to the shower house and you just stand there in that, you know, long, hot shower and you think what a luxury that is. And that's just one example of the things that we grew to appreciate. Um, mm. When you see real poverty, I mean, like gut-wrenching, poverty, people just living in horrific circumstances, there is nothing that you take for granted. After you travel the world and you see what else is out there, both rich and poor, you you feel a lot of gratitude for what you have, the place that you occupy on this planet. Mm. That's amazing. You know, you're so you're traveling, you're seeing different cultures, even in the different cultures, you're seeing different social classes, seeing all these people people living and you know it's it's interesting I, i've had a chance to travel to different places and it, it's funny because oftentimes i get in an area where it's not really affluent right but they're some of the happiest people i meet you know and they're just like you know they they make it work when when you're traveling and you get kids on the boat and you're living in you know in under a thousand square feet you're making do with a you know a gallon of water shower right i, I think for me if it was a cold shower i could have done with a half a gallon i'm just saying right so <laughs> Right. Well, you don't have to wash your hair, right? So <laughs> right, right. There's that. Yeah. Well, fortunately, mine keeps falling out, so it works out good. All right. Less water for that too. But did you notice that just in the traveling and having to adapt to the different different living conditions and being around all the different cultures? One of the things that I I, I often think is is missing in education is that we don't really give young people the the skill set to develop thinking skills and to really do that kind of critical thinking. And, you know, and I'm all about independently responsible learners. That is just all, everything we do in our programs is how do we foster that? How do we create that? How do we get them? How do we get them in that space from the academia world? But when you're out in the, you know, in the world, right? Did you notice for yourselves, like raising kids on the boat, did you notice that that gave them the opportunity to, to develop those critical thinking skills and to be more independent? Yeah, so one of the coolest, I can give lots and lots of examples, but one of the coolest things that happened was our um, number two kid, his name is Aaron, he actually gets horrifically seasick. He was probably the least happy on the boat as a boat when we were in a place anchored or at a dock, he was fine, but the actual traveling made him pretty miserable. But he loves to fix things and he loves anything mechanical and he loves engines. And when he was um, seven, he met this guy who was tearing apart um, outboard motors for a living. So he would buy a lot of, uh, you know, broken motors, fix them up or scavenge parts from the ones that weren't going to be able to be fixed up. And we got into this conversation with this guy at the marina and he, he invited Aaron to come over to his boat one afternoon when his school was done um, and tear apart a carburetor in this little outboard motor. Well, this kid who had been dragging his feet through the academic part of our school day, suddenly his school was done by 930 in the morning. He, he gets up, he gets everything done and he says to me, hey, mom, will you take me over to Jim's boat? And I'm like, well, don't you have school to do? And he goes, no, I already did everything. I'm ready to go. And so they become very motivated to do the things that they love to do. And so at age seven, Aaron got to tear apart, you know, 
outboard motors with uh, this guy named Jim. And uh, he learned how to drive our dinghy because that was interesting to him. And uh, you can get your little Coast Guard boater's license. Um, I think he was nine when he did that. And that meant that he could get in the dinghy and drive to a friend's boat by himself. I mean, wow. that, that's the equivalent, you know, of like getting your driver's license when you're 16. And he had yeah. a radio and they knew radio protocol. They could radio over to a friend's boat and say, you know, hey, I'm done with my schoolwork. What are you guys doing? Um, can I dinghy over with my brother and can we come play Legos? And then they would hop in the dinghy and go visit a friend's boat. And then I could call them on the radio. It gave them this amazing independence that I'm not sure that they would have had in the same way in a suburban neighborhood. Right, right. Wow. And, and even just in being there, like knowing that you're in a marina and you 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 know who the other boat owners are, you or you at least get to meet them as you're there. It's like, um, it, it's like I get to see, like in Europe, you know, yeah, kids still go out on the street and play. Like they can yeah. go out, they can be outside, they'll go to the parks, they, you know, they still do those things where in the States, sometimes we don't get to see that very much. But it sounds like that they had that kind of an experience in the boating life that it was like you knew you knew where they were and you could still they could be out and be be around and, and be around people, which is awesome. So oh yeah. I felt like I feel like we stepped back in time. I mean, when we were buying the last house that we bought, we had driven through the neighborhood when we were, you know, house hunting and we saw all the chairs on the front porches and we talked to people who were walking their dogs. We were always looking for this kind of like 1950s neighborhood. Like I wanted to step back in to leave it leave it to beaver or something i wanted to have the kind of place where my kids could you know play kickball in the street but what we discovered once we moved into the neighborhood was that you know the sun would go down and the eerie blue glow would come out of all the neighborhood windows and everybody was inside shut up watching television or it it was like invasion of the body snatchers or something i really don't like yeah. that about american culture i really want this i wanted this piece of community that I think is really hard to find now. And when we moved on to our boat, that's what we found. So if we're living at a marina, there's people sitting outside, they're having potlucks up at the pool, they're playing cornhole, they're, um, you know, doing costume contests at Halloween. And it's a real community that, and we help each other all the time. You know, people, you're either in need of help or you're the person helping all the time. And so it's a very close knit community. And then when you're traveling, you're anchored somewhere and you're running into old friends that you, you know, maybe met a year ago, a year ago at a different, at a different location. And so it, it is that old fashioned community that we were really looking for. Wow. That's amazing. You know, you think it's like, okay, because you know, oftentimes I think if people are thinking they're living on a boat, it's much more isolation, but you, you haven't had that experience at all, which is really, really great. Well, actually, it's kind of feast and famine. Oh, so sometimes it really is. Like if you think our longest passage was from Georgetown, Bahamas um, to Palmas del Mar, Puerto Rico. That was an eight day, eight night passage. So we left uh, we left Georgetown, Bahamas and then didn't see another human being until we showed up, you know, eight days later. And it's just um, you and the fish and the birds and the sea and the sky and, you know, an occasional passing ship on the horizon. It's it's very, very quiet and lonely and life is reduced to whatever you need to do to keep yourselves, you know, fed and rested and comfortable. But then you show up in the next location and there's all these new people and new places to go and new foods and a new language. And it's really exciting. So it kind of it waxes and wanes. Some seasons, there are a lot of kids that we meet. And then other seasons, our kids have had to be their own best friends. Gotcha. Wow. Well, and that's perfect because that gives, gives them that opportunity to be able to experience it all. So there's family, there's friends, it's being socialized, being able to be with each other when there's, you're not able to do that. It's amazing. And, you know, we look at that, right? And you look at your kids today, this is how they grew up. So, uh, how they turn out, right? Because you've got three right. that graduated, right? So, you know, what what was, you know, are they do they come back and say, mom and dad, thank you so much for, you know, giving us this experience, but kind of like, where are they today in the world as they're starting, because they're, um, I, I think you've got a couple of them that are already independently living and they're on doing their own things. Uh, what's it like for them now and how are they doing? 
So um, I did not know till we got back to the United States, they had never sat in a classroom. They had never taken a standardized test. They had right. only done, you know, like portfolio reviews right. with, you know, for their annual evaluation. I didn't know till the day that they took the PERT test to take college classes, whether or not I had succeeded. For me, that day was a day of pressure. Like, did I do a good enough job? And when they all passed that test, I kind of breathed this sigh of relief. I'm like, okay, they might not actually, you know, fit in with their peers, but they're going to be okay. They got enough of an academic education that they're going to be able to fold back into that system. Um, so they were, you know, taking college classes while they were in high school. I was really, really excited that they felt comfortable doing that. And they had um, old friends in the Florida Keys. And so they were able to kind of do that with a community of people that they knew. Um, but then my daughter, Sarah, went off to a dude ranch for six months. It was a job that she found on her own. She had to interview. Um, she had to turn in references. She had to write, you know, an essay in order to be selected for that position. And that was something that that she did that gave her a lot of confidence. And I think that kind of adventurous personality, I think our, our life really fostered that kind of adventure. My oldest child recently said something um, that I found really surprising. I always view our life as kind of extreme ups and ex or extreme highs and extreme lows. The, the ups are very up and the downs are <laughs> very down. And I always thought, well, I hope that there were enough highs to make up for the lows. And my son said something recently about being thankful for the lows. And I was like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Like storms at sea and living without air conditioning and, you know, and, you know, sometimes running out of things and being, you know, far from people. And he said that those are the things that he actually values now as a human being. They have made him who he is. And I'm, I can't believe that all, he's not even 22 yet, that an almost 22 year old could have that kind of perspective is amazing to me because I, I don't think that I had that perspective at 22 that even the negative things, you know, build character. The fact that he can appreciate that soothes my, you know, soothes my worries that they're going to remember only these bad things. Um, obviously, they have the experiences of swimming with whale sharks and climbing volcanoes and, you know, hiking through jungles and eating mangoes off of trees, you know, in the wild. They have those experiences, but then there were lots and lots of negative things, but even the negative things, um, it turns out, have some benefit. So I feel really gratified by that. Um, my second son who got seasick, he left the boat. He'll probably never step foot on a boat again. Um, but he had the confidence to come to us and say, I really don't like the academics at this local community college. I don't feel like it's benefiting me. I don't like jumping through other people's hoops. This isn't accomplishing any of my goals. This is what I would like to do. And he had figured out where he wanted to go to school, what he wanted to do. And he ended up at Universal Technical Institute in Orlando, um, tearing apart engines, which is what he always loved to do, and rebuilding them. Um, he's working on his own old Ford truck. He's got a 95 Ford F-150 that he's kind of been rebuilding piece by piece in his spare time. And the fact that he had the confidence to say, this is what I want, and then go after it is a direct product of the way that my husband and I operate. Because we're the same way. You know, we said to our our families basically like, okay, we're going to sell this house in Atlanta. We're going to leave a perfectly safe and happy life. We're going to leave our jobs. We're going to leave civilization. And we're going to move on to this boat with our kids. And everybody thought we were crazy, but we knew what we wanted and we went after it. And I think even if our kids don't end up on the water, we're already seeing that the oldest three have that mentality of, hey, I have this idea and I want to go after it. And that to me is very, very gratifying as a parent. I don't, I don't need them to pursue some dream that I have for them, but I really need to see them figuring out what they want and then going after it. Wow. That's amazing. So I, you, I know there's some of our listeners right now and they're listening and they're like, they want to do what you've done, you know, and they want to just think, you know, think about that. I know you have lots of, um, lots of things on social media, but we'll put all, all up on the, uh, Put all up on the in the show notes, but if people are like you have a blog uh, that's called uh, take2sailing.com. So 
uh, in you, your book out, your book that's out with the memoirs book, and you have a new book that you're working on. I just love it. So there's Facebook and Instagram and Pinterest. So you have all these different ways for people to connect to you. We'll make sure people can can uh, can have access to that. But when people join you on social media, are you giving people like the how tos? Because oftentimes it's like people. I think a lot of times people get stuck because they they think that, well, I want to do that, but it's it's overwhelming and they're not sure what to do and how to do it. Do you kind of guide people through that or kind of just kind of coach them and, hey, if this is what you're up to, go for it? Or, you know, what, what does that look like? Yeah, I do a lot of coaching, actually. Usually it ends up being one-on-one. Somebody will contact me through the blog or through a Facebook page and say, hey, we are thinking about buying a boat and we're just wondering, you know, how you got started. And then I usually you know, through instant messenger or emails or phone calls have done lots of one-on-one coaching. In a more general sense, the message that I am always sending is if you have an idea, go after it. If you have a dream, follow it. You only have this one short life. You don't know how much time you have left. You need to do it and do it now. And so that message comes comes across all the time. And then there are the practical considerations. Um, the book isn't so much a how-to. Um, like a how to go sailing with your family. The book is much more about the philosophical underpinnings of following a dream. And so that would apply to, you know, anyone who's interested in leaving the beaten path and trying something new, whether that means starting your own business or homeschooling your kids or traveling for uh, as a lifestyle instead of taking vacations. All of those things um, are addressed in the book. And then some of the, and some of the practical things like how do you make a living and how can you live debt free and how can you live on one salary like if if you're homeschooling and you want one person to be dedicated to homeschooling that's going to require a sacrifice, things like that we do absolutely address those things. That's so great yeah because it's not just about the boat, especially we get our people out there like I get seasick okay. That's not your path, right? But there is a path and they can find that by, you know, there, there's the model that you lay out, but that model can be re- replicated to lots of different lifestyles. Not oh, for sure, for living. sure. So that's really Yeah, awesome. and actually my husband gets seasick, so that's not really much of an objection. He oh. just, yeah, there's good, all I can say is there are good medications. And so okay. when we're, you know, that number of days that we're actually at sea during the year, even when we were traveling all the time, you know, it's, travel for a day, spend a week, travel for two or three days, spend a month. You're mostly anchored or in a marina. You're not actually out on the open ocean as much as maybe you might imagine. Um, So you take medication the night before you go sailing, you sail somewhere. And then when you're there, the real benefit to the travel is, you know, being in a place and traveling slowly enough that you get to meet people and see what a place is really like. So it's not really like being on a vacation and it's not really like you know being on a cruise where you're crossing an ocean it's right. much more about slow living and slow travel and there's medication for seasickness i mean it, it's very similar to the rv life we have lots of friends who've done the rv thing as well where you you know drive and spend a season somewhere and then when the weather changes you you know pick everything up and get the rv and drive to a new place and then stay there for a while it's a very similar lifestyle. Mm, that's awesome. Well, for people that are out there and they're trying, they're interested in looking for that dream and how do how do you fulfill it? We've got the answer for you by checking out checking out Tanya's uh, to her book and all of her different social media, be able to see all that. Uh, and if it's okay with you, Tanya, let's come back and do this again because let's follow up and see where your next adventures lead to and what's up and how you how your kids are doing and how you know what they're up to because yeah, I think it's really great to see that foundation that you've given them and some of the things that they're starting to move into now as they are out on their own and being independent, living on their own. But what are they going to be up to in the years to come? So we'd love to follow up again. We'll come back and do this again. It would be great if that's okay with you. Sure, it sounds good. And we did um, we did a lot of road travel while we were stuck stuck in one place during the pandemic. And um, you know, with teenagers on the boat, we drove uh, eight thousand miles in eight weeks, and we did this huge trip out west. So I'd be happy to talk about um, traveling in other ways with the family as well. Oh my gosh, that sounds awesome. Well, very good. All right. Well, we got more to come then. That's what's great. So it's good. 
Well, everyone, thanks for tuning in today to A Plus Parents. Tanya, thank you for you making your day work and your family. And thanks for what you're up to. It just is very inspiring and encouraging for people that want to go out there and kind of get out of the dorm. So it's really great. Okay, everybody, we'll see you next time on A Plus Parents. Thanks for tuning in. Bye, everyone.